when patients come in and they discuss having had recurrent implantation failure or recurrent failed IVF treatment cycles, we start to look at what else might be causing um, them to not have a successful pregnancy because oftentimes um, patients that go through this, unfortunately, they're not given a straight answer as to what might be causing them to not have a positive outcome with IVF and or why they might be having recurrent implantation failure even though they're transferring very high quality and sometimes even high quality but genetically normal um, tested embryos and they still don't have an, a positive implantation. And so we have to start looking at additional factors and causative factors that can contribute to the risk of implantation failure and can contribute to the chances of success for a treatment cycle like IVF, which requires such a high level of emotional, um, temporal, and financial investments. So there's a lot at stake for patients and we really need to be very thorough um, when we approach these, these types of treatments, making sure um, we're looking at from a big picture, all of the other factors that might be impacting their chances of success. And researchers are starting to do just that with newer research around something called the reproductive microbiome. So we're looking at the microbiome and it's become, I think, almost like a trending kind of topic or, or name um, that we're hearing more and more about. So microbiomes basically refer to a community of microbes, bacteria, fungi, um, viruses, and they usually coat the surface of a particular organ. And we're seeing that the reproductive microbiome is very much thriving, whereas before we used to believe the uterus was actually um, sterile, which is not the case that we've seen um, over the last few years with newer technology, newer testing uh, methods using um, a, a type of analysis which actually screens for RNA and this helps us to identify different microbial communities and what percentage of those communities are actually present in that particular microbiome. And w these researchers are starting to see a difference in the microbiome of the uterus and in the microbiome of the vaginal canal between patients who have positive outcomes with IVF and patients who have a negative outcome with IVF. And we're also starting to see a difference in this newer research between the endometrial and the vaginal microbiomes, between patients who have recurrent implantation failure and patients who do not have recurrent implantation failure. And they're not as straightforward as one would expect. It's still a very new topic and we're learning a lot more about different microbes, um, different bacteria and how they may be beneficial or harmful and maybe supportive or work against um, an individual's fertility and the chances of succeeding with a fertility treatment. So in particular, when we're looking at uh, patients in this um, population that are dealing with infertility, first they looked at in this new study that was recently published um, in the Journal of Clinical Medicine, patients who were just going for an IVF uh, with an embryo transfer. So patients that went for an embryo transfer um, if they uh, were succeeded with this embryo transfer and had a positive pregnancy um, through that treatment, their microbial communities were actually quite different from patients that did not get pregnant with the embryo transfer. And the main changes we're seeing, just to summarize um, you know, and generalize what we're seeing and without getting into the hard, hard specifics and details, is we're seeing more uh, an important role more of an important role for a particular group of bacteria called lactobacillus species. And lactobacillus is, um, you know, it can be broken down to very specific genera. So we see lactobacillus inners, lactobacillus jenseni, lactobacillus helveticus. And we're seeing that these different lactobacillus bacillus species have different roles. Now, lactobacillus in general is, uh, is hypothesized to be a very pregnancy-friendly microbe because it helps to prevent the overgrowth of other microbes and bacteria. It can help to prevent infections. And it does so without causing inflammation. And this is, ve this is very key. Um, reducing inflammation along the endometrial lining, along the vaginal canal, 
this seems to have an important role in supporting implantation and supporting pregnancy. And the way lactobacillus species are able to help prevent infection and the spread or growth of other microbes without causing inflammation is they will alter the pH. So they help to maintain a more acidic, um, a more, um, acidic environment in the vaginal canal. So it lowers the pH um, of the vaginal secretions and this will help to prevent the overgrowth of other microbes. So in patients that are seeing a higher pregnancy rate with IVF and with embryo transfers, they tend to have higher levels of lactobacillus species in the vaginal canal, as well as the endometrial microbiome, so in the, in the actual uterus. And similarly for patients that have recurrent implantation failure, we're also seeing specific changes uh, between uh, patients that have recurrent implantation failure and those that don't. We're seeing specific changes in the microbiomes between those two groups of patients. So specifically, um, in the vaginal microbiome and in the uterine microbiome, we're seeing an increase of a particular microbe called Prevotella um, species, which can actually increase the amount of inflammation um, and kind of like a microinflammation without perhaps it being noticeable or even patient having signs of an infection or pain, uh, but it can cause a, a change in the amount of inflammation along the uterine lining and may impact chances of uh, success and, and chances of implantation. And specifically with lactobacillus, we're seeing among the different types of lactobacillus species, they're not all, they're not all equal. So not all now lactobacillus species are actually beneficial for fertility. We're seeing certain lactobacillus species like lactobacillus inners, lactobacillus uh, genseni, seem to have potentially more beneficial impact where patients that have higher levels of lactobacillus helveticus, for example, may actually have a potentially higher risk of uh, implantation failure or recurrent implantation failure, um, which is known as RIF for short. So I think this is a very interesting avenue um, that we need to pay attention to and patients who have um, unfortunately gone through a multitude or multiple cycles and, and multiple implantation failures, unfortunately, we need to start looking at how the microbiome may be playing an impact on their chances of, chances of success. Now, this particular study was limited because what we established through this research paper was a lot of significant correlations, but not causations. Um, but it is still very interesting nonetheless how simply manipulating the microbiome of the vaginal canal and the uterus may potentially have an impact on a patient's chance of success with a treatment cycle that can co cost upwards of $20,000. And the microbiome is, is very much dependent on a lot of lifestyle, dietary factors, um, things like prebiotics, and the impact or role of certain antimicrobials um, that may be able to help eradicate some of these harmful microbes. So if this is something that you've been through um, and you're not sure why it's not working and there are no answers right now, there has to be a conversation about the microbiome um, and the reproductive microbiome in particular here and how it may be impacting your fertility, either positively or negatively, and what testing um, methods are available for this, and if unavailable, what prophylactic treatment options there are uh, for patients who otherwise have no other explanation of why their treatment cycle isn't working. And this is something we've seen that has helped quite a number of patients where they've had recurrent um, miscarriages and no one can figure out why um, or recurrent implantation failure and just by altering the microbiome very soon after the treatment cycles that they do or natural cycles where they get pregnant are uh, in, in a variety of cases fortunately successful. Um, so clinically we're seeing patients that are responding well to this and again it comes down to each individual patient and whether this is actually a factor because it it probably is not a factor for 100% of patients but that number of patients where we are seeing this as an issue, um, it should be at least discussed and there should be a conversation about what we can be doing to support the microbiome for you as well.